everyone. I'm Melissa McAllister, and you're listening to The Melissa Made Show. Now, for decades, I've dedicated myself to helping women break the cycle of dieting, navigate through all the fads, and change their lives through my nutrition coaching. Now, each week, I'm going to talk about everything from deep nutrition, mindset, self-care, the ideal workout routine, tips on how and why to implement intermittent fasting in your life, my favorite recipes that are not only crowd pleasers, but they're actually healthy for you, and so much more. Now with small and consistent changes, you can defy aging while living a happier, healthier, and more heart-filled life. I'm so excited to show you it's possible with the right strategies that are so simple to adopt. All right, everybody. Uh, as you know, I have been anticipating this podcast for a really long time. Uh, let me give uh, Dr. Terry Walls uh, probably not a good enough introduction, um, as I respect her so much, but uh, just give you a little bit of information on her before we get started. Um, but she is an Institute for Functional Medicine certified practitioner who conducts clinical trials in the settings of multiple sclerosis. In 2018, she was awarded the prestigious Institute for Functional Medicine's Linus Pauling Award for her co contribution in research, clinical care, and patient advocacy. She is the author of The Walls Protocol, a radical new way to treat all chronic immune conditions using the paleo principles and the cookbook, The Walls Protocol, Cooking for Life. She has made significant contributions to the field of functional medicine and autoimmune diseases. And that was a mouthful. What I want to say is she's the goat. She's the greatest of all time. So we have, you know, functional medicine practitioners coming out of the woodworks and they're amazing, but she personally has been practicing medicine for over 30 years. She was diagnosed with relapsing remitting MS in 2000, yet she is an avid cyclist and has competed in multiple races and triathlons. She has helped thousands upon thousands of patients improve their health. And it's just a total honor to be able to pick her brain today. So I want to thank you, Dr. Wall, so much for being on this podcast. Thank you. And thank you for all the work you were doing. Well, thank you so much. So I, I would love to start this interview with uh, you just kind of sharing, uh, obviously, your personal journey sure. uh, with multiple sclerosis and how that led to you developing the Walls Protocol. So, you know, in retrospect, my symptoms begin uh, during medical school, uh, and I had these electrical twinges of pain that will get worse over 20 years. Mm -hmm. Then uh, in 2000, um, I developed leg weakness. I see my neurologist, and uh, I get a big workup, takes about three weeks. During that time, actually, I'm praying secretly for a fatal diagnosis because I, I don't want to become disabled because you know, I'm still athletic then. Uh, and, you know, I hear multiple sclerosis, so I do my research, I see the very best people in the country, at the best MS center in the country, I take the newest drug, so I'm treating my disease very aggressively. Within three years, I'm in a tilt recline wheelchair, uh, and my face pains relentlessly worse, my 10 year old daughter's hugging me as tears stream down my face, and I ask myself, am I really doing all that I can? So I go to start reading PubMed every night, looking at the animal models of MS, Parkinson's, Huntington's disease, ALS, uh, dementia, and decide that mitochondria are the driver of disability. So I, over time, I create a mitochondrial supplement cocktail that slows my decline. I'm very grateful. Uh, I'm still declining. My face pain is still getting worse. I discover a study using electrical stimulation of muscles. I ask my physical therapist, can I try that? Uh, uh, it, he says it's for athletes, but it does let me have a test session. Hurts bad, really, really bad. But when it's over, I feel great. So we add electrical stimulation to my physical therapy. And I can do 10 minutes of exercise. Otherwise, I, I can't function. I, I'm still mentally clear, so I have a zero gravity chair where I lean back with my knees higher than my nose. Mm. And that's how I staff patients. That's how I live when I'm at home with my family. I'm eating meals like that. So my family's nervous, I'm gonna choke. I'm beginning to have brain fog. My chief of staff uh, assigns me to the traumatic brain injury clinic. I'll start in that new job in January. And he describes the job, I can't do it. 
I know that it probably means that come January, I'll go to the clinic, I won't be able to do the job, and I'll finally have to take medical disability. I also discovered the Institute for Functional Medicine. You know, the, the week after my boss tells me I'm going to have to go in January to uh, the traumatic brain injury clinic, I take their course on neuroprotection. And they talk a lot about mitochondria. And I have a longer list of supplements, which mm -hmm. I add. Then I have an aha, and Melissa, I'm so embarrassed. It took me so long to have this aha. What if I redesign my paleo diet that I've been following for five years, gluten, you know, no grain, no dairy, uh, based on the list of nutrients? So it's more research. I uh, have this new way of eating that I start December 26th. And at that time, you know, I can't sit up. I'm beginning to have brain fog. My face pains are a little too worse. I know that my future is becoming bedridden by my illness, probably demented by my illness, and probably having my face pain turned permanently on. So when that when it's on, I can't swallow without triggering the pain, and I cannot talk without triggering the pain. When I try to talk, it sort of sounds like this, Melissa. Because I can initiate vocalization, but the pain turns on and I grimace and I, I, I can't continue the vocalization. So I, December 26th, I now have a very structured paleo diet. January comes and the first two weeks, I'm just watching my new partners from my you know zero gravity chair looking you know pretty bad. The third week I start and on Monday I come home and I tell Jackie, you know, that wasn't too bad. And I also say, could could we get a regular chair I want to set up for supper? So I, I sit up for supper for the first time in years. At the end of the week, I tell Jack, you know, it, it's not too bad. And when I see my physical therapist, he says, we're going to advance your exercises so I can now do 10 minutes twice a day. And we begin advancing my exercises, advancing my e-stem. And I begin walking in the hallways, stunning my colleagues. They haven't seen me walk in years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, yeah, that, and I walk a little more uh, with one, two walking sticks, and with one, then with none. I, and then on uh, Mother's Day, uh, we have an emergency family meeting because I have it in my head. I want to try riding my bike for the first time in six years. Wow. Jackie tells my 16 year old son, who's six foot five, big boy. <laughs> Zach, you run alongside on the left. She tells my daughter, who's 13, she should run alongside on the right, and she'll follow. And I get on my bike, and I bike around the block. And that big 16-year-old boy, he's crying. The 13-year-old girl, she's crying. Jackie's crying. And I still cry when I, when I tell that story, because it was at that moment that I understood the understanding of secondary progressive multiple sclerosis is incomplete and who knows how much recovery might be possible so I, I keep riding my bike a little bit more and then in october jackie says let's sign you up for the courage ride 18.5 miles and you know when i finish crossing the finish line once again my children are crying jackie's crying i'm crying and this changes how I think about disease and health. It will change the uh, way I practice medicine, and it will ultimately change the focus of my clinical research. Mm -hmm. And so I've, I've since made it my mission to teach the public that, yep, there's a whole lot you can do, even if you are profoundly disabled, that may change the trajectory of your health. And I teach uh, clinicians how to approach um, complex chronic diseases. That's about as inspiring as it gets. Um, and I, you know, and I'm sure it was your family that, that pushed you, uh, to keep going, um, which is probably why they were so proud of you. Um, can you share with us, you know, kind of what the key principles of the walls protocol yeah. is, um, and how it helped patients. And I'm really curious if, if you wouldn't mind sharing, cause it's kind of my beliefs too. I, I've always been more of a paleoesque kind of girl. Um, what mm -hmm. what made you go that route uh, to not you know be so uh, grain and dairy heavy? So I had followed a vegetarian diet for twenty years, and then I adopted the Swank diet, uh, very low fat, uh, when I was diagnosed. 
Uh, and my neurologist uh, told me about uh, Ashton Embry, his work, uh, and Ashton Embry introduced me to the paleo diet. So I, I read Lauren Cordain's uh, work, his papers, and decided, okay, this makes sense. I will give it a try. Uh, so I eliminated all grain, all dairy, all legumes, and I continued to decline. But it was a little more slowly. And I felt like, okay, at least I'm doing something. And uh, I really attribute my children to saving my life. Because, you know, uh, I, when I'm diagnosed, I'm an athlete. And I, and I lose that first, then I lose normal function. Uh, but, uh, and I have to keep reimagining what being a parent looks like, what being a spouse looks like. And what's really important to me are, are that my children become emotionally and financially successful. And that I know my children are watching me. So I can either give in to the despair that I felt, and let me assure you, I felt plenty of, of despair, or I could model that, yep, life is tough, so what? You get up and do the best you can every day. Uh, you know, my children still talk about how they saw that when I couldn't run anymore, I put in a pool, I did my pool exercises every day, no matter what, and then I went off to work. And I would sometimes do a little pool thing in the evening. Mm. And that, you know, it's, it's sort of funny, uh, both of my kids uh, had to have more uh, family chores than perhaps their friends. Uh, and they both complained quite bitterly <laughs> about cute. age 10. None of my friends know how to operate the uh, washing machine. None of my friends know how to operate the dishwasher. It's not fair uh, that it's my job. And so, you know, I, I'd say, well, you know, you're so right, it's not fair. It is not fair. It's also not fair that I have MS, but you know, that's life. You know, my chore is I, I go to work. Your chore is that you're gonna do the laundry uh, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And uh, you know, then my kids stomp their feet. You know, I think you're glad you have MS. So you can lecture me about chores. Now, you know, both my children are horrified that I tell the story now. <laughs> How, however, I, I let them know this is a very child, you know, like thing. Every child will do this uh, at that age. But they also talk about how inspiring it was that I kept working out every mm. day, even though they could tell it was getting harder and harder and harder. Yeah. And that I didn't complain like, OK, this is life or we just keep doing the best that we can. Gosh, I bet you've got hardworking children now. <laughs> uh, hardworking children. And and they both uh, understand that life isn't fair. Right. You get good good outcomes that we're thrilled about that weren't necessarily fair, but we got them. Mm -hmm. And then we get bad outcomes that we're really unhappy about, but that's life. So you're just like, okay, yeah. uh, there's a gift here somewhere. I'll have to think deeply about what that gift is, but there's always going to be a way forward. Yes, 100%. Uh, would you be willing to kind of walk us through a typical day of what eating and exercising on the Walls Protocol looks like? And uh, how it's sure. a little bit different than, than dietary recommendations, I guess. Correct. So for me, I often eat every other day. So on okay. a day that I'm not eating, I just get up, do my workout, have green tea or detox teas, uh, and I drink water throughout the day. Uh, and uh, then I might make a phosphatidylcholine smoothie with some uh, phosphatidylcholine, uh, fish oil, olive oil, um, uh, and blend that all up with some uh, green tea or some other uh, uh, herbal tea. Add uh, a fiber such as inulin, uh, and some chia seed, mm -hmm. uh, and then that uh, is my evening meal snack, uh, which has a few fat calories but you know, less than 300, maybe about 150. Uh, and I have that while my family uh, is having their meal. And then on a day that I'm eating, I, and uh, we'll uh, say uh, this day, I, you know, I get up, I do my uh, workout, my uh, sauna I, and a uh, cold shower mm -hmm. I, and a meditation. All of that takes me about two hours. Okay. Okay. So. Depending on what I've got going, that means I'm getting up and getting started at five or maybe at six. 
I, and then I'll have a variety of teas throughout the day. Uh, and then uh, tonight, uh, we're going to have, I believe, lamb, uh, mm. big green salad, uh, asparagus uh, from my yard. Uh, and uh, we also have cherry trees. Uh, so cherries are coming in. So I'm going to uh, pick a nice uh, bunch of cherries. And so we'll have cherries. Uh, and uh, I predict that we're going to have with that salad, uh, a lot of garlic, um, uh, uh, some onions, uh, maybe some uh, uh, radishes in with that salad, a olive oil um, uh, and fresh herb kind of dressing to go with it. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure my son's going to have some lovely wine and I'll have to decide, am I going to have the wine or not? Um, I, I'll, uh, because his in-laws are from Australia who are here, I'm sure they'll have a very lovely wine and I'll probably have a small glass of wine uh, with everyone. I love that. Now, so for me, I include intermittent fasting in my routine. Uh, and what, what we talk about, Melissa, is that I want people who I work with and who follow me to improve their diet at the pace that they can manage. So, and I will have a conversation, I'll evaluate them. And depending on the medical condition, I may recommend an elimination diet, I may recommend food sensitivity testing. And then, so we have a recommendation and then I ask, okay, so tell me, can you do this or do we need to start at an easier starting point for you? Good question. I want them to be very successful. Yeah, and if they need an easier starting point, then my next question is, okay, so what could that be? And so it might be for some folks, you know what, I can't do diet yet. I'm gonna have to work on stress reduction or exercise. I'm like, okay, that's fine. Or they may tell me that I could maybe do walls level one, or they might say, you know, money's really tight. I have to help me figure out uh, finances. So maybe we're going to talk about a Mediterranean diet that has more legumes and we're talking about pressure cooker. Or uh, people might tell me that my family's not bought in yet. And so we're going to talk about intermittent fasting uh, with the usual diet. Because I, I, I want whatever we select to be something that they know they could be successful at. So our next check-in, they're saying like, yep, I nailed it. Whatever, whatever that next step was. And then we keep making little improvements along the way. Now, my preference is that they do Walls Paleo from day one. And I'd say the vast majority can, but if they can't, I'll still work with them. And we'll find out what's the win that they could do. Eight hour abs, that sounds like a dream, right? What if I told you, you could work on those abs while you dream? It's not too good to be true, I promise. It's something I discovered almost accidentally that gives you incredible results with minimal effort. The idea behind this is actually in what you're not doing. By giving your digestion time to rest, you allow your body to tap into its fat stores, hence working on that six pack while you sleep. All you have to do is eat within an eight hour window and leave the rest up to your body. I wrote the eight hour abs diet back in 2014 to help people learn about the importance of meal timing. Intermittent fasting has been a huge part in helping me stay in the shape that I am. For me, intermittent fasting means eating in an eight hour window, and I'll give you my insight on it in this free ebook. With proper meal timing, you will not only look better, but you're going to feel better too. So learn more by visiting melissamadeonline.com forward slash ebooks and get your free copy of the eight hour abs diet today. I love that. And I, you, so many triggers for me. I'm a, I'm a very avid. If you go on my social media, it's, I think the first thing I've listed is uh, intermittent fasting. I've been doing that. I, I joke accidentally for over 25 years, purposely for the last 10 years, because I didn't yeah. know I was, I was fasting and, and um, I attribute it absolutely uh, big time to my health uh, at almost 50 years old. It's, it's my, it is uh, super good for us. It, you know, our, if we look back into our ancestral history, you know, for 6 million years, separate from the primates, 2 million years as the homo genus, 250,000 years as homo sapiens, 
we would work really hard to get our food. So we'd be in ketosis on the basis of exercise. Mm -hmm. Then we've gotten our food. The uh, uh, women of the clan, we were closer to home. We're doing gathering our nuts, uh, 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 tubers, leaves, berries, and whatever small game we could capture in our nets. The men got the big game and lugged them back. So we now have food and uh, the women uh, were cooking the food. The men eat it first and we get to eat. And we have a couple days of plentiful food. Yeah. Then we run out and we got to do it all again. And we don't have much food and we're out working and we're in ketosis because we're having to work hard and we don't have a lot of food. We get our food. Then we have a couple days of plentiful food higher in protein, non-starchy carbs, a lot of fiber, and a fair amount of dirt. Yes, probiotics. <laughs> and so that's what our evolution expects is that we go from having plenty of food, plenty of protein, a lot of fiber, fair amount of dirt, to several days of not enough food and a hell of a lot of work. Yeah. That is so I, I try to do that without having to live, uh, you know, with, with the benefits of having a, a comfortable bed to sleep in. <laughs> I love that. Now you mentioned, oh, there's so many things. Uh, um, actually, I'll, I'll ask you. So you mentioned um, when you first started uh, your, your own treatment that you were on a, a low fat diet. And now, you know, I hear the, 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 the omegas and stuff that you're putting into your concoctions and obviously it's so good for the brain, which is important to you. Uh, was there a certain moment in time when you're like, this low fat diet isn't working for me and I need well, to increase that fat? You know, what? Uh, how the evolution happened, I uh, was a low fat vegetarian uh, from medical school on. Mm -hmm. I, my parents who are farmers said, you know, Terry, you're, gonna, you're killing yourself. You need all that meat. And being a rebellious person, I, that you know, made me more resistant. Sure. I get diagnosed with MS. I want to know what I can do. I find uh, the Swank diet book, which reinforces the low fat. Mm. Uh, and I'm making homemade whole wheat bread, uh, which I now know was a big trigger. I had uh, skim milk, skim milk cheeses. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at it from a heart standpoint, it would have been looking like a very uh, great diet. Mm -hmm. uh, plenty of legumes, plenty of vegetables. Uh, and then I get introduced to the paleo diet by my neurologist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it takes me six months to ramp up the meat because I hadn't had it in a long time. Uh, and I'm still going downhill, but I'm thinking, I don't know how quickly things turn, turn around. I, and so I'll be like, okay, maybe this takes four or five, six, seven years. But at least I'm doing something. Uh, and so I continue and I add my supplements and that's, and I can tell if I don't take my supplements, I feel much worse. Mm. And so it you know, makes me more excited about reading the science. And I do add some fish oil. I, and I take the um, neuroprotection course. So I'm adding more fish oil. I, and I decide to add, add a little more olive oil. And it, you know, it's when I redesign the paleo diet in a very intentional way that the magic happens. You know, I, our food is so much more complicated that has so many more molecules, so many more compounds. And I, I challenge everyone that yes, supplements can be super helpful. And I take a bunch of supplements, absolutely. But it's the food that is where the magic is. Amen, 100%. You mentioned uh, really quick uh, phosphatidylcholine, which, you know, my, my nutrition brain knows that word and very familiar with it for motility, uh, you know, for gastric motility. Uh, can you tell me, you know, what made you choose that, that compound uh, to, to incorporate for your own healing? Well, you know, I, I'm looking at myelin mm -hmm. uh, and I'm thinking, what are all of the compounds in uh uh, myelin. And this is about the cell membranes. So the, what are all the compounds in cell membranes? It's the omega-3 fats, the omega-6 fats, the phospholipid complex, which, you know, slowly declines as we age and mature. And that 
when you go from 40 to 50, there is an acceleration of the aging process uh, for mm-hmm. women. Uh, for men, it, it begins at age 40 and it, they go downhill uh, as well. Uh, and so restoring that phospholipid complex is a wonderful anti-aging strategy mm-hmm. and a wonderful strategy for um, uh, myelin. For people who tolerate eggs, eggs, you know, really great uh, nutrition for that fossil to col- for that choline. For me, if I have eggs, it triggers my face pain, so I can't have eggs because it, it turns on my trigeminal neuralgia. And eggs are a, you know, the third most common food sensitivity uh, protein. Therefore, I'm like, okay, um, what what are other options? So meat is part of that. Uh, but then looking for a phospholipid complex, uh, um, I uh, found the body bio phospholipid complex. I started using it. I started uh, using a whole lot of it. You know, I gradually increased the dose. Uh, and that was certainly very, very helpful. And so I take a bunch of phosphatidylcholine lip- and lipid complex every single day. Okay. I did not know this. That's absolutely fascinating. I love it. And if you look, coincident, this is not a funny, I've got a, um, almost like I put it here on purpose. This is a food sensitivity test. And you've talked about that. Yeah. You guys should um, follow Dr. Walls flat out just for the food that she makes. It is so beautiful. And you make me hungry every time I see what you're cooking for dinner. It's so beautiful, such a, an array of colors and such a huge variety. I, I learned from you from that, which, you know, obviously the cookbook plays a big role in that, but there's, there's, there's controversy about food sensitivities. Um, yeah. Can you share your, your input on that? So when I was in the VA, uh, the veteran affairs system, I, I get turned on to um, functional medicine. Then I have my personal transformation, which is, uh, you know, quite remarkable. And I start treating people using these concepts in primary care in the traumatic brain injury clinic, but I can't do any functional medicine testing which at the time was really quite annoying, but like, okay, well, that's how I'm going to have to practice. So what I can do is uh, I take advantage of groups. So I start making group visits and we could really work on modifiable lifestyle factors. And I would put people, if they were open to it on an elimination diet, taking out grains, legumes, nightshades, eggs, uh, and of course uh, dairy. And then after three to six months, then we start reintroducing foods. And we had s- spectacular results, uh, spectacular, with people with complex chronic diseases, uh, psychiatric comorbidities, uh, glucose metabolism comorbidities. And we're reversing diseases, reducing meds, uh, simplifying uh, medications. I'm having to make presentations to medicine, uh, especially medicine, the pain clinic. Uh, the chief nurse exec, the chief uh, physician, chief of staff, chief of pharmacy, Uh, quarterly, then the VA national office comes out to see what I'm doing. And what I realized is, yep, you can do an elimination diet and have marvelous results in my, and you could really transform people's lives with very, very basic primary care testing, lipids, glucose, A1C, insulin, homocysteine, vitamin D level. And you know, that's it. We didn't need fancy functional medicine testing. Then when I retired from the VA and started having my own private practice, I could give people the option like, okay, we can just do the basic primary care stuff that we can get through your insurance and that'll be easy. Uh, If you have the resources and you want to do food sensitivity testing, some more advanced testing, so we could really personalize your supplements and your diet uh, and have some folks that are totally down with that. And of course the food sensitivity testing can be, can be super helpful because you may discover that there are things that uh, I don't routinely eliminate on the elimination diet that the person may have trouble with citrus, for example, yes. or pork um, or shellfish. And so now we have a much more personalized diet regimen for them uh, for yeah, and again, I can decide as a three month or six month intervention, and then we can reintroduce that food on an every four day rotation and nearly always it's going to be fine. Yeah, that's, 
that was a great explanation and more personalized. I always tell people we can guess or we can find out. <laughs> yeah. It, it, and you know, other people know that in the VA, I would say 80% of folks did really great. And we had transformative results. And they were uh, living and shopping in rural Iowa, their small town, tiny grocery store, getting canned vegetables and frozen vegetables. And they still did really great. Yeah. However, if we can personalize it, uh, things can go faster. 100%, 100%, love that. So can you tell me right now what projects you're currently working on and what we can expect from you in the future? Okay, so uh, I, I'm a crazy individual. <laughs> I do clinical research um, at the university. I have um, my own private practice uh, and I teach the public and I teach clinicians. So I do all of those things. Uh, and one of the things that we've got going right now is a research trial comparing a ketogenic diet with time restriction, olive oil, lots of olive oil, uh, instead of dairy for the fat, uh, compared to a paleo elimination diet, uh, compared to usual diet. Wow. We'll follow people for three years and we'll include patient reported outcomes uh, like quality of life fatigue, clinical outcomes like walking hand, vision function. And I'm very excited about this. We're gonna have MRIs at the beginning in Ooh. MRIs at the end. And one of the questions we're asking, Melissa, is if we teach people how to improve their diets, can we get the rates of brain aging to match healthy, which would be less than 0.3% per year? Because people with MS, our brains as a group, shrink 1% or more every year, wow. which is why we have higher rates of frailty, nursing home, cognitive decline, job loss, et cetera. In my clinical practice, improvement in thinking and mood come very quickly. Improvement uh, in memory and recall come very quickly. So I am super optimistic that we'll be able to capture this and measure it uh, over this two year time span. So, and this will be one of the largest, longest dietary studies that have ever been conducted uh, in the study of MS. So. That's very exciting. And your listeners can learn more about that at terrywalls.com forward slash MS study. Uh, and I'll make sure you have those links. Okay. Uh, so that's, uh, and we have room yet for 60 more people. So I'm hoping that in your audience will have some folks with relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis who will come screen and get uh, involved in the study. Then the other thing that I'm doing is, again, my mission to teach the public uh, is I'm hosting an MS and Neuroimmune Summit that will uh, occur between July 5 and July 11. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is for people with multiple sclerosis and other autoimmune conditions that have neurologic or psychiatric symptoms or other variations of autoimmune conditions that are attacking the brain in the peripheral nerves. And you know, I'd also say people who've had cancer and who've had, um, are, they're free of their cancer, but are stuck with persisting neurologic symptoms, whether it's fatigue or neuropathies from the chemo, this would be super helpful for them as well. So I've, so I've interviewed 50, 50 clinical experts, 50 um, you know, or researchers or entrepreneurs about the protocols uh, and the types of products that can help reduce symptoms, improve quality of life for people with multiple sclerosis. Gosh, such good work, such good work, thank you. Um, I'm going to leave you with one question that hopefully is a quick answer. Um, if there was one thing that you could uh, pinpoint that you have seen as just the biggest misconception of uh, living a healthy lifestyle today, is there one that just kind of sits on the forefront of your mind? Like, yeah, this is just, we need to change his thinking. <laughs> well, uh, that it, it uh, I'm too ill, uh, I'm too disabled, I can't recover. Or <laughs> that I've been told that your disease is a progressive illness and uh, you're gonna have to take these terrible drugs. We can slow it down, but we can't stop or reverse it. Mm. Like, oh my goodness. We always have things that we could do that could shift our current uh, living 
daily habits into a slightly more health promoting habit. Yeah. And you can do it at a pace that you and your family can manage. Uh, and it, it, and food is add more of the good stuff. And then as you do that, you'll substitute some good stuff for some of the bad stuff. You could add a little um, stress reduction, if nothing else, go to the bathroom, shut the door and do a couple of deep calming breaths. People won't interrupt you in the bathroom unless they're toddlers. And then yes, they will come in and interrupt you. (laughs) But there are always things that we can do. That's something I'm going to take with me because I, you know, when I do speak with a lot of people, they feel too far gone. And I just love that advice uh, very much, Dr. Walls. My heart is full. Um, I'm again, I'm just so grateful to uh, have you uh, still teaching uh, still, you know, not only the public, but other clinicians being there for people running these studies, which are going to be groundbreaking. And just from a personal perspective, uh, you're helping me grow, helping me stay, you know, so current with what is going on today. And I thank you so much for all that you do. And of course, I thank you for being on the podcast today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love what you're doing as well. Thank you. So you guys, I hope that you wake up feeling prepared, especially after today's podcast. And I hope you go to bed feeling proud. Have a great day. Thank you. Wow, we've reached the end. But before I leave you, I'd love to hear from you. After all, it's not every day that someone reaches out and asks for your opinion. And to me, your opinion does matter. So please share this episode with anyone that you think needs to hear this message. And remember to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. My name is Melissa McAllister, and until next time, thank you for being your own health advocate.